Ahoy! Have you ever gone down a rabbit hole and you got deeper and deeper and deeper and spent hours, days on it and then started wondering why you're even doing it and why you're so deep in it and you couldn't get out? That is me right now. That is me with the topic of shirking fortification and elemental aversion. So today I'm going to dig myself out of that hole. I'm going to try and give you a basic overview of some of the things that are important in this context. Now, today we're going to lay the foundations a little bit, which may sound boring at first, but there are a ton of interesting discoveries in here that I made along the way. So it'll tell you a lot more about how the game as a whole works, how certain mechanics work, uh, how worth certain things are. And I think that's going to be very interesting. And that will give us the things that we need to, in the next days, talk about optimal builds for different roles. This is more than a week-long project at this point, and it would simply blow the framework of a single video. So let's begin with one thing that is very important when it comes to taking damage in general and that is understanding what sources of damage are what type of damage. I briefly touched on this a little bit recently and I wanted to quickly give you a better overview here. So I try to take the perspective of a bruiser in Outpost Rush and estimate what are the most important damage sources for a bruiser that a bruiser can get hit by from enemy players. Now, this isn't perfect, because depending on how that outpost rush is going, how the team composition is, everything can change. So this order is very flexible. This is just a general basic idea of how I think things will roughly look a lot of the time. If you were in light or you were in heavy and your positioning would be different, then you may take different sources of damage more seriously, or you may simply get hit by different sources of damage more. So our first area that we want to look at here is elemental damage reduced by elemental aversion. As Fusion Thunder has established a while ago, not every damage is reduced by elemental aversion, so that's going to be important later, but let's begin with the damage that is actually reduced. One of the most important sources, I talked about this recently, is detonate. This is probably the most scary damage source for any browser because if you're dying, it's likely to either melee damage or detonate most of the time since those are the biggest bursts that you can take. When it's de melee damage, it's often because multiple players are attacking you. Uh, when it's detonate, it's just someone diving in when the detonate is ready. This is often in combination with Grafwell, but I think in OPR in particular, at the moment, Fire Staff is also very, very dangerous because there are a lot of Fire Staffs going around and a lot of them will also focus the clumps. Though I, to be honest, see more Fire Staffs trying to do 1v1s where their potential is honestly a little bit wasted. Outside of that, anyone using a ranged weapon with elemental gems will also be reduced by elemental version. This includes not only magical weapons by default, but also bow, for example, or a musket or whatever else you want. So that's something worth keeping in mind. There's a little bit of extra reduction there. There is blunderbuss damage that is also reduced. Aside of the obvious elite gem, uh, you can have the splitting grenade and the Athos shrapnel blast, which are both reduced because they're both elemental range damage. Some Ice Gauntlet abilities, as well as some Void Gauntlet abilities, and the normal basic attacks, ranged basic attacks, from both weapons are also reduced, but not all of them. There are some outliers here as well. When it comes to damage sources not reduced by elemental version, one very important one is damage over time effects. This includes Rune Glass, but also other damage over time effects uh, from elemental sources. There's quite a few out there. Uh, those are typically not affected, though there may be exception to that rule. And then also, obviously, attunement, which you can have both on melee and ranged weapons. Some Ice Gauntlet abilities are reduced. Again, Fusion Thunder has tested this. This applies for Ice Spikes and Wind Chill, whatever. But uh, Ice Storm is also only reduced for one tick. So a little bit of extra damage coming in from that. Uh, likewise with the Void Gauntlet, obviously, especially Void Blade is not reduced. Uh, then also Oblivion is not reduced and Void Caller passive if you care about that. And then there is technically also melee elemental gems, which are also not reduced because that's melee elemental damage. But not many people are running them at the moment. Most people are running Opal. So what you can see here is if you look at these damage sources, the vast majority of damage is in this area. There isn't really that much damage between these sources. It's still a reasonable amount, I would say, especially the dots. I think I wouldn't underestimate in the human. But comparatively to the damage that you're taking that is reduced, it is relatively minor. I would say it's probably less than 25% that is not reduced by elemental aversion. And then we have to look at the physical side of things. Here we have ranged physical damage. We have the bow, we have normal blunderbuss attacks, most of the abilities are reduced because they're elemental. We have the musket, again if there's an elemental gem here then it's also reduced by elemental aversion, same with bow, blunderbuss, but the normal musket damage is not. And Cannon Blast is also counted as ranged physical damage. As you can see here, different color. This is the only one that is strike damage. 
And then we have the melee damage sources. Obviously, just all of the melee weapons here. I don't need to list them all out. I put the greatsword at the top here for OPR because... Obviously, that's going to be your biggest threat most of the time because it does the most melee damage, but the Great Axe is also pretty commonly used still. So, yeah, it really depends on what you're playing as well and how the, the composition is. But what you can see here overall is that we have a bunch of different uh, color codings. So we have on the physical side just Thrust and Green, we have Red Slash and we have Purple Strike. But on the elemental side, we have two types. We have the blue damage which is basically just anything that comes from an actual mage that is just actual magical damage that person probably has uh, 150 int and then we have the yellow side which can come from mages partially some of these abilities uh, but will often come from characters that don't have the 150 int perk which is going to be important in just a second what i want you to pay attention to at this point is the fact that many of the in my opinion higher damaging damage sources here are yellow. They are not necessarily affected by the 150 in perk, which will be relevant when it comes to the overall damage that we take in general. For this next section, I'd like to thank Jescapades, who created this overview. It is a little bit outdated. She made some corrections to that since, because there were some changes along with the PTR change, there were some other changes, but that's not important for us. The formula here is not important. It's not quite accurate anymore. What's important for us are these two things in particular. The first thing to keep in mind, these two things, Fortify and Rend here, are no longer under Absorption. They are moved to their own Fortify, their Armor Fortify category. The other things pretty much still apply. So what you can see here are various sources of damage absorption, as well as base damage multipliers, and also base damage reducing effects. And out of these tables, out of these overviews, I've made another overview that kind of focuses on the damage sources that are relevant for us. So for example, one base damage multiplier that I did not include is the Punishing and Sided Rune Glass, because I haven't honestly seen all too many of them since the patch. Most people are smart enough to switch over to gems, again, normal gems, instead of having Rune Glasses on armor, uh, since that is simply the safer bet with Fortify being nerfed. So this is something that's going to be an outlier, maybe on an occasional musket or something, but very few people are using them still or will be using them in the near future, I think. Likewise, I excluded perks like ward perks that have no relevance in PvP, which we're going to be focusing on. And that brings us to this overview. We begin with base damage effects. So, when I made my first video, Micro made a video discussing why he thinks shredding fortification may be better in certain situations based on how base damage effects in New World in general work. And I thought that was a very interesting suggestion that I wanted to look into further and see which effects affect that how. And we will see various examples of that and how different values factor in here. But for now, I wanted to talk about the effects that can even exist and how they function. So the first base damage increase that we have is an Opal, which is simply active whenever your stamina is not full and gives you 15% extra base damage. Or if you have the Rune Glass version, then you still get 12% extra base damage. So what's important here is that these effects do apply to most things you do with weapons, but not to everything. For example, they do not apply to Detonate. So Detonate would not benefit from this extra 15% base damage, which is very important because Detonate is one of the biggest damage sources. Detonate still benefits from a lot of other things, but specifically from the Opal, it does not benefit because it seems to be tied to the weapon. Then we have Invigorated Punishment, which gives you 2% damage per buff on the player, up to 16%. For all calculations that you'll be seeing in the next days as well, the assumption is always that there is a 2% effective invigorated punishment if Shirking Fortification is active, simply because that is kind of a given when you have Shirking Fortification. The number of stacks of Shirking Fortification, however, does not matter. If you have 5 stacks, it's still just 2% on invigorated punishment. It is important to know how exactly this works, because there are a ton of buffs that don't actually activate Invigorated Punishment. So, for example, your food buff would not activate it, your Honing Stone would not activate it. It's actually just player-made buffs, so to speak, that are tied to your kit uh, that will apply Invigorated Punishment. So it's very unlikely that you'll actually see 16% unless you've also fully stacked on buffs and have a ton of fortifies on you. Light armor attackers get a 20% base damage increase and medium armor attackers get a 10% base damage increase, also something that will be factored in into all of the calculations. And then we have a variety of other sources. So, for example, the 50 strength perk, which I rated as decent, it's like not the best perk but not the worst, uh, is a 10% 
melee basic attack damage increase, which is great as long as you're basic attacking, doesn't do anything for abilities, but this is base damage. Likewise, the 100 strength perk is a 5% strike and slash damage increase, and this one is for all of your strike and slash damage, so most damage from melee weapons, excluding stuff like Graf well, that is not counted as slash damage. The 200 strength perk is probably the most consistent one because it's a 10% base damage increase on targets that are CC'd. This does not include flatten or knockdown, but it does include slows, and slows are very frequently applied to enemies, especially in larger fights. The dex side is looking a little slimmer. The only increase we're getting here is a 5% thrust damage increase at 100 dex. When it comes to intelligence, we have a 10% magic basic attack damage increase at 100 int. Uh, this one is probably mainly beneficial for the fire staff where basic attacks are a bit more important and obviously for the void blade. Other than that, it's still a nice damage boost for your basic attacks, but in my opinion, most threatening damage from ranged elemental weapons is typically from abilities. And that's where the 150 int perk comes in, one of the strongest perks in the game, in my opinion. 15% elemental damage across the board. Uh, this is base damage, this applies to everything you do, and this will increase a ton of different sources of damage. So this is a very important one, and this is, in my opinion, one that makes the inside a bit more threatening here compared to the physical side. And at 300 int, we get 10% extra damage on the first hit against the target with full HP, which is kind of irrelevant. Based on these values, Mikro's conclusion was that most of the time we'll have around 30% base damage going against us uh, when we're getting attacked, which I think can be true, but it doesn't have to be true. For example, it assumes 100% opal uptime pretty much, otherwise you're likely not going to reach that. Invigorated punishment usually doesn't give you that much. Light armor and medium armor have always been factored in, so it's more down to these perks giving you 15%, which is true when you're looking at int but with strength it's a lot more difficult, it has a lot more conditions that are required, with thrust you're likely not going to reach it most of the time. So yeah, it can be so or so, uh, but we'll get to the int part and why it's not really a problem uh, later down the road. Spoilers, one of these things is called elemental aversion, so it's kind of what it counters. Speaking of which, when we look at elemental aversion, then we have a reduction of 3.9% per piece with a maximum of 5 pieces. Uh, we also have some other perks though, which are Warhammer and Great Axe, both having 12% damage reduction during grit, which is quite relevant, especially with the Warhammer using your abilities, you will quite often have grit. And with the Great Axe, especially during Maelstrom, you can utilize this as well. Obviously, while you're light attacking, you will get less out of it. That is, unless you're running 300 con, then you pretty much permanently have it. I'm not 100% sure about the last one, I haven't verified it, but I'm fairly certain that Defiant Stance also counts as a base damage reduction. Uh, either way, it's a bit of a niche build anyway, so I'm not too concerned with it, but I wanted to add it here because I think it should be working. So there's quite a few ways in which you can also reduce the incoming damage at least a little bit. But those are just our base damage effects, then there are of course also fortifies. I'm not gonna go through all existing fortifies, but just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, one that is obviously gonna be looked at here is choking fortification, that's the whole point of this. Then we have fortification from both abilities and weapon perks or armor perks for weapons uh, because various effects there provide you with actually quite a lot of fortification. And then we have Oak Flesh Bomb and Gemstone Dust that both count as fortify now as well as sturdy fortification. So a variety of different fortifies but we also have the counterpart which are rends. Here we mainly have abilities and weapon perks that provide you with rend, for example Sundering Shockwave or Skyward Slash. And then we also have Trenchant Rend as an option that you can use on your weapons, which is rarely used though. So we generally have more fortifies than rends. We also have rend on hard runes and so on. So there is a bit of rend happening here and there and, and you can effectively apply a decent amount of rend, uh, but generally you can apply more fortify than you can apply rend because you, for example, don't have rend consumables or additional armor perks that provide rend to the enemy or something like that. Both Fortify and Rend can be removed. Fortifies can be removed with various nullifying effects, whereas Rends can be removed with cleansing effects, especially with cleansing potions and wars. The third type of damage reduction that is important for us here is damage absorption. This mainly comes from your gems on your armor, so your onyxes and your opals or whatever else you're running, but also from your protection perk on your amulet. So for example, if you have slash protection on your amulet. So, now that we have this introduction, I will give you a taste of what's to come. This table was made by XR and Jescapades, thanks again for letting me use this, and I have modified it a lot. So if there are any miscalculations or anything, that's on me and not on them. I've 
gone uh, a bit wild with this one. So what you can see here is just the basic overview of damage taken, uh, or rather the damage that you can survive. And we are not going to go into detail here. So this is all effective health in various scenarios with averages, with light versus light, light versus medium, light versus heavy, medium versus heavy, and so on, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. And this is also just one assumption. Basically, this is just on a level where we're assuming even balanced gems for everything. And it goes well, well, well beyond that. But I want to show you uh, what kind of changes you will see here, depending on how the damage is coming in. So this is our baseline. This is the calculation I used when I first talked about this. And honestly, I kind of would have liked to leave it at that because it was complex enough as it is. But we're going deep now. We're going really deep. So this is, for example, what would happen if we add 15% base damage, incoming base damage. Like I said, this is something that can easily happen. This would, for example, be uh, an Opal. Then this is what would happen if we added 30% base damage, uh, which is, again, possible as well. So, for example, this would be uh, someone with 150 int and an Opal that is active. And this is what would happen if we add 20% Fortify as well, like, for example, a Sacred Ground and a Graph Well, or secondary effect from the life stuff, like an Orb or something. So, something that is also very frequently going to happen. And this is what would happen if we reduce the base damage by 12% because we are having grit from our Great Axe or from our Warhammer. And then this is what would happen if we drink an Oak Flash potion and have 55% Fortify. And this is what would happen if we use an ability on top of that that provides us with 20% Fortify, like for example, uh, Wrecking Ball, I think, is one of them. So you can see that we can go very far in many directions here and get many different numbers and many different values that we can compare to some degree. And that is what I will go into in the next days and talk about what this means for gearing in light, in medium and heavy, uh, and what I think is overall your best bet, because obviously you don't want to have 20 different gear sets. If you want to go back and pause at any of those numbers, you can do so, but this will all be explained in more detail. I will leave you with this for now, and if you're interested in knowing how exactly to gear for your role, for your loadout, then consider subscribing and clicking the bell so you get notified when those videos come out in the next days. If you enjoyed this video, I'd much appreciate if you leave a like as well, because this has been a ton of effort, so that would help me a lot. Thanks to my patrons for making videos like this possible, and thanks to Jessica Pace and XR for their work that this is all founded upon. Thanks for watching, and I will probably see you for the next part tomorrow. Duke Sloth, out.